just wanted to share, um, and some of you may have heard it this morning, um, NPR had a piece early in the news hour this morning talking about Ohio. And there was a staggering, staggering statistic that was shared by one of the pediatric leaders of the state of Ohio. As you may know, there were over 10,000 COVID positive cases in our schools last week. He said that of the school districts this year who started the year with all grades masked, there have been 8% testing positive. In the school districts that started without masks but added masks in this school year so far, 32% of testing coming back positive. But in the schools in the state of Ohio that are still unmasked, the number is 59.5% testing positive. We are basically sending our children to be sick unto death in some cases. We have to do this better, you know it. So the mask story must get cleared up. Last Sunday, um, that mask story came home to me <laughs> When I worked, walked away from church for the first time in 36 years of serving, after spending six hours with three of our grandchildren on Saturday at 1031 last Sunday morning, I got a text from my oldest son, Luke, that our oldest grandson, Benton, had tested positive for COVID-19. Within 10 minutes, Mark and Emily and I were caucusing and it was decided that Emily would preach my sermon and they would split the other parts of the service. And I wanna thank you for being so proactive and I needed to go into quarantine, which I did. Um, we tested, both Susan and I tested negative on Monday and again on Thursday. Uh, Benton is getting better. It's funny, I shared with everybody what we went through and they said, I, we don't really care. We wanna know how Benton is. <laughs> Benton, thanks. <laughs> so, Benton is great, he's coming along, he's doing fine, the whole family is doing well, um, and they're battling through this bumpy week of quarantine, uh, but I appreciate your concerns and prayers for my entire family, especially for my oldest grandson, Benton, who Sunday afternoon called me and said to me, Pop up, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I got the sickness. No child should have to say that at six years old. We can do better. COVID-19, and you've heard me say it a million times, you'll hear me say it a million more, it's a hitchhiker. And last Saturday it hitchhiked a ride on our love and good intentions and landed in my backyard. Uh, it does what it wants when it arrives. So let's again work together to end this, okay? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. It's not every day that a person like James comes along. And if you don't believe me, ask his brother, Jesus of Nazareth. James's gift to the church universal is a simple message. Talk is cheap. Discipleship is costly. James grew up with Jesus and probably no one in scripture except Mary, Jesus' mother, knew him better. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, James begins to step into leadership in the church. He begins to embody for the followers of his brother the, that actions speak louder than words. Famously, he claims, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but do not have works. Can faith save you? Faith without works is dead. Another way to put it is God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense. In his short five chapter letter written to the church in Jerusalem, James is very concerned with Christians being people of justice, being very practical, down to earth and real. He delivers some tough words for those in the Jerusalem church who speak in uncontrolled language. He differentiates between earthly and heavenly wisdom. 
Earthly wisdom is often packed with envy and selfishness and is often boastful and false to the truth. Whereas heavenly wisdom, James writes, is pure and peaceable and gentle. It's always willing to yield. It's full of mercy. It's full of good fruits with no partiality toward anyone and never hypocrisy. So earthly claims to be wise, heavenly is wise. He warns people to not follow their own plans, to not get caught up with their own possessions. He encourages Jesus' people to be patient with each other and to keep the promises they made to God and to others, to pray for each other and to believe that prayer heals the sick and then to step into it and give everything you've got to pray for the sick and always to remain faithful to God no matter what hard things come at you. James is a how-to kind of Christian. He follows the KISS principle. Keep it simple. Yes, it's true, I dropped the second S. <laughs> Confrontation, challenge, and commitment meet you in this letter to the church. As the last of his 107 verses, again, a very short letter, come to an end, James focuses on the wandering of people from the truth of God and being brought back again to God. He says, my dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them, get them back, and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. Now, most of our letters end with a greeting at the end that sort of says, and I love you, I miss you, I'll see you soon. That's where he ends. <laughs> it just ends it there. This is truly fascinating though. Listen to this, just for a second. Listen one more time. If you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't never, never write them off. Go after them rescue their precious lives from destruction and prevent an epidemic of wandering away from God. Well, James, I hope you're listening to us this morning because you're talking to the right people. We know a lot about wandering off. We're all good at it at certain times. We know a lot also about the preciousness of life, the power of destruction, and particularly we know a lot about epidemics. In fact, our epidemics, James, have become so large that we have a new name for them. They're global in nature. We call them pandemics. Throughout the last 19 months, we have been dealing with all sorts of epidemics around us. We have epidemics of COVID-19 with multiple layers of health, political, bad behavior, and economic challenges. The epidemic of racism and its shadow side, which is the epidemic of lies that racism doesn't exist, continue to rock us to the core. The epidemic of economic crisis in jobs and housings, and of course, the pandemic of war and refugees and immigrants and global warming. Yes, James, we know a lot about epidemics, but one thing you bring up is something new to us, maybe. It's the epidemic of wandering off and away from God. So I want us to consider the centrality of wandering away from God as an epidemic for a moment. This 2,000-year-old prophet calls us back to reality. Wandering away from God has become such a rampant epidemic in that the wandering is blessed and God ends up often getting condemned. Let me put it another way. God gets blamed for being God while people exalt themselves and their own spiritual powers and wisdom and expertise. In scripture, the author of the 66 books are always, the authors of the 66 books are always pointing to a higher good, a greater power, the power and presence of God. In today's world, the authors of wandering away from God point to themselves, to their empires, to their wisdom, to their ways, to their quick fixes, to their self-fed and self-created spirituality. 
Essentially, this wanderlust is fed by a culture of narcissism. Now, this isn't a new idea. Some of you remember Christopher Lash's book in 1979 by that title, The Culture of Narcissism, American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations. This summer on sabbatical, now you're gonna be sorry I was on sabbatical, right? So, I read the book again. Lash is prophetic 32 years later. It's like we're looking at ourselves again, all over again. He wrote that we have organized our society to live for the moment and to feed the ego of each of our individual selves. I certainly see this sickness alive and well in the anti-masking, anti-vaxxing movement. It's about freedom, really? Tell me about that. I'm not real patient with that this week because that freedom got my grandsons sick, two of them as a matter of fact, one in another family. So come hell or high water, you want to say it's about freedom, but that means that you're caught up in the freedom of narcissism, which is not free at all. I also see in the movement the teachings around race and racism to take that out of our schools is another sickness, if you will, to say that we don't have to talk about that because that's not real history. In Christopher Lash's words, to live for the moment is the prevailing passion. To live for yourself, not for your predecessors or for posterity. We are fast losing the sense of historical continuity, the sense of belonging to a succession of generations originating in the past and stretching far into the future. In this present moment, I want us to consider this simple action which speaks louder than words, after all. I want us to switch directions in our wandering. Instead of wandering away from God or encouraging everybody to do just that, let's wander home to God. Let's wander home to God. Instead of living for yourself only, live for your ancestors, your predecessors, your posterity. Live for the future generations. Think about what legacy you will live and leave in this world. Simply put, as James would encourage me to do, live for God. Live for God. Let's flip the script. Let's start a movement wandering home to God. And if you're not sure where I come up with these crazy ideas, check out the history of First Congregational Church. It's in our DNA. 27 women and 15 men. And I want to point out that it's normally and usually my experience that women lead men in a two to one number for just work. It's just true. I expect an amen from at least one woman in the room. So um, anyway, they founded our congregation 169 years ago today. These 42 pioneers looked at their sickness and their world, which was slavery and all of its poisonous, venomous byproducts. They acted rather than spoke. They got up and they moved. Their actions said as white abolitionist Christians, we can no longer and will no longer abide in the union of Christian faith and a nation which embraces in any way, shape or form the existence of slaves and slave owners. We can't do that anymore and we won't. They were not just abolitionists, friends, they were leaders in the Underground Railroad movement in Columbus and Ohio as well. Back in 1852, the only other congregations in the city of Columbus that were abolitionist congregations were African American, mostly made of former slaves. Can you imagine what it must have been like the day before September 26, 1852, to be all alone in fighting for yourself and your own freedom and then on September 26th, 42 white people say you're not alone anymore. Can you imagine what it's like to know that the next Sunday you go to church, there's gonna be another church in town that believes slavery is wrong and says it loud and clear every Sunday in the pulpit. That would be very reassuring at least at least you'd know that someone was stepping forward with righteous and just action. 
for your children and for your spouse and for the men and women in your family, those enslaved or not. They knew that on that Sunday there were others and that they were praising a just and liberating and freedom-loving God, a real freedom-loving God. For one thing, our sisters and brothers in black Columbus must not have felt so alone 169 years ago today on their battle, in their battle for freedom. They came alongside us and in the first years of our church, I love to tell this story, they were the only ones that would fellowship with us. Guess what happens when you do the right thing? Your former friends show you their former friends. We found out that day and in the weeks and years that followed who our real friends were when we chose to be real friends ourselves. So here we stand 169 years later and we're still kicking. You look good kicking by the way. As you and I wander home to God today, there will be those who wonder if we are truly and faithfully following Jesus. They will cry out to us that in your big effort to end racial and economic injustice and the pandemic and global warming and everything else, do you still love Jesus? Are you truly saved? They'll ask you. Some of them are your family members who question the church you go to, I guarantee it. And the answer to yes to both is yes. Yes, I love Jesus and yes, I'm saved. End of conversation. I remind you of the words of William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist and leader of liberation for all from slavery. When challenged by an ultra evangelical woman, she asked if indeed his soul was saved and Wilberforce answered, Madam, I have been so busy trying to save the souls and lives of others, I have had no time to think about my own. Great answer. That's all you have to say. I know James today is standing shoulder to shoulder, somewhere in heaven, smiling down with William Wilberforce. I also am not sure about the ultra evangelical woman, but I know she's frowning somewhere in eternity. It doesn't matter though, does it? It's not our problem. What's happened to them? Our problem is getting back on track and getting back to God. We know that those who bring sunshine into the lives of others cannot keep sunshine from themselves. And most certainly we know that those who bring the lives of others to God cannot keep God out of their own lives. So let's do this. Let's live in this present moment as those who honor our past and celebrate our spiritual ancestors. Let's live for the future moment and protect and serve our neighbors and the generations of children yet to be born or those that are struggling in this day to live fully. Let's just live for God and answer the question as you go out today, what will your legacy be? What will your legacy be? How will you be remembered? How will you be celebrated? Let's take a page out of the letter of James to the church in Jerusalem. The answer's right there on the page. Faith without action is dead. And who needs a dead faith anyway? So let's get to work. Amen.